Welcome to another episode of Rising Tide, the Ocean Podcast. This is David Helvarg, and today Blue Frontier's Natasha Benjamin will be joining us once again as co-host. Hey, Natasha. Hey, David. So I think the last time you co-hosted, we interviewed a longboard surfing legend, uh, Cassia Midor. So we're kind of on a theme here. Uh, our guests today are film director, cameraman, photojournalist, and surfer Lewis Arnold, and his collaborator, critically acclaimed author, writer, and producer Chris Nelson, also a surfer and co-founder of the London Surf Film Festival. Together, they've, they've over the last three years, worked on an important new documentary um, just about to be released titled The Big Sea, looks at one of the dirty secrets of surfing and its environmental impacts. But before we get into The Big Sea and, and the work around your film, maybe you can both tell us how you first connected to the ocean, uh, I assume, early in your lives. I first connected with the ocean because I I was brought up in a small town called Tynemouth, which is on the mouth of the River Tyne in the northeast of England. Um, it was quite a quite a big fishing town at the time. It was really part of the uh, you know the sort of local heritage, a connection to the sea. It would have been about thirteen when I first encountered surfing in the North Sea. The first sort of explosion of skateboarding it was around that time. Time. So sort of the board sports culture. And there was a, a guy who was a really good roller skater and he decided to take up surfing and uh, he kind of led the way and we all followed. That's that's my first connection to the ocean. And that's Lewis, Chris. Yeah, I, I came to surfing quite late in that I grew up inland in a city called Leeds in the north of England. And um, one night, Kind of, it was in the early days of kind of all night TV, and I caught this glimpse of surfing on a program, and I was fascinated by it. And um, this was before I could drive, so I was still kind of quite landlocked at the time, being an hour from the coast. As soon as I could drive, I was straight to the the coastline, which happens to be the same coastline that Lewis grew up surfing as well, which is in the the northeast of England on the the North Sea, which is quite cold and um, was quite polluted back then. But for me, that that was when the obsession started and it's kind of been a lifelong obsession ever since. I started um, my career as a photojournalist. I got a job. I was lucky enough to get a job as a trainee photographer in like a really busy, um, a really busy photographic department. I think there was like 32 photographers working there and I was the junior. Over time progressed really got into my photography and my personal work was always shooting surfing and over time that is I've left mainstream media and everything I do now is focused on surfing it's surfing related in some way a former colleague was working at the Guardian and they'd been reporting on Cancer Alley that colleague sent it over to me because she'd read it and she'd found out that it was regarding neoprene and she knew that I was a surfer so I started looking into it and I hadn't, I'd never heard of chloroprene. Like I can't, I couldn't tell you exactly how many I've had, but a lot of wetsuits, all different brands, the purchasing decisions when you're buying a new wetsuit, switching brands, which one's best, but I'd never heard of chloroprene. My background's a little bit different in that I came up through like the surf media. So I was a magazine editor, surf, skate, snowboard magazine editor. So I'd always been involved in the surf media and then I was like a freelance writer and um, worked on some documentary series and wrote a, a number of books about surfing. And um, I was tipped off that Lewis was working on this project and I was gobsmacked. You know, a friend said, oh, you know, have you heard about this? Lewis is, um, has found out about this substance called chloroprene and... Um, and I, I just couldn't believe it. I was I was shocked and horrified. Yeah, so we've been working together for the past three years. And um, it's been like an onion in that you just peel back layers. And the more you peel back of the story, almost the worse it gets. Right, because this is, this is not just for surfers, but anyone who wears neoprene, divers, um, at, you know, really any water activities where you require that. Um, can you Can you kind of just recap you know, the, the main focus of the story and what you guys found through this research over the three years 
what, what is the crux the crux of the issue here around neoprene and the manufacturing of it and and why surfers should care about this i believe surfers should care about this story because you know for years surfing's been relying on neoprene by far the largest ingredient of neoprene is chloroprene chloroprene largely by a company called denka and they operate a chloroprene plant in louisiana on the site of a um, former plantation and that census tract next to the, the this plant has by far the worst risk of cancer in america and it's in the media and it's been subject to like assessment by the epa the situation hasn't improved i think it's it's a really important story to tell because surfing for one kind of relies on a sort of a connection to um the environment the marine environment but in reality a lot of the uh, the equipment surfing relies on in particular the wetsuit is really damaging to the environment and also in this case to a what tends to be a low income minority population maybe tell us more about where you shot i mean southern louisiana along the lower mississippi is as you say it's known as cancer alley for all the petrochemical complexes and low income predominantly african american communities where is this facility located and and what, what's it like down there and who are the people you met the uh, the denka plant is in reserve which is near Laplace, which is kind of in between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. It's about a 20 minute drive from New Orleans. There is, as you say, it's it's part of Cancer Alley, which is about a sort of, I think it's about an 85 mile long stretch of industry all along the Mississippi, which has about 200 chemical plants, petrochemical facilities, cement factories. There is, um, there's all sorts of heavy industry. It's it's quite an amazing place to behold. Um, I think it's actually one of the most industrialized zones in the Western Hemisphere. The worst zone for cancer risk is the census tract next to Denka. It's kind of like the worst bit of a bad area. Over time, we've we've come to understand that the, the this company Denka, they really will do anything to avoid having to clean up their act with regards to their chloroprene production. The company own, owns a second facility in Japan, which purports to make a different type of neoprene, um, which is called limestone neoprene. But in reality, they're both exactly the same uh, chemical structure. So the vast majority of safe and wetsuits, the largest component of that, of those wetsuits is chloroprene from Denka. I personally find that an affront when surfers relying on this product when we've seen firsthand how damaging that is. Um, and hopefully through this film, the wider surfing population will really get to see the human impact of this reliance on chloroprene. The cancer risk in this area is 50 times the national average, whereas Cancer rates can be very confusing because it's to do with statistical analysis. And you can bend statistical analysis to basically prove anything you want. So you could say the cancer rates are elevated, but you could also analyze the data in a different way by using different size populations to make it seem as though the cancer rates aren't as bad within this area. But a cancer risk is something that you can scientifically prove, and that's something that the, the EPA uses their benchmark. And, you know, so 50 times the national average is, is a horrendously high cancer risk. You know, there's nowhere really comparable. I think the, the actual, when you work it out, it's 1,505 in a million is the risk. Whereas if you live, you know, on the West Coast of America, it's about 23 in a million, you know. So it, it's that degree of, of difference. But one of the things that I think we're trying to communicate in the film is is the actual human impact because the figures the figures can can just be confusing and misleading but when you go in and you talk to the population and you hear their lived experiences 
you know, like Lewis and I have gone in and met so many members of the community who tell us about generations of families that have been impacted by cancer. And then they will point down the street to houses, you know, and their neighbors and their next door neighbors. And many of them are relatives because, you know, when the plantations closed down, the local community had a chance to buy land. And this was to be basically their forever homes. And they built their homes with their own hands. And so often neighborhoods have a lot of relatives living close by. So these families are impacted generationally by this pollution. I wonder if there's some people um, in the community you've interviewed who stand out, uh, stood out to you, stand out in your film. Yeah, definitely. There is a gentleman called Robert Taylor. And since the the EPA put the information out about the um, chloroprene emissions from Denka and the risk it posed, he has been really active. He's become an unwilling but really effective um, activist against Denka. You know, he's it's, he's he's a he was a musician in his younger days. Then he was a, in construction, and now he's have become a an activist to motivate the local population to try and fight this. And he's been frustrated by inaction of people who he would have he expected that would be helping his the cause of the local people. But instead of being deterred by that, he's become more and more determined. You know, I've got nothing but respect for Robert. He's not single handedly, but he's he's really motivated the local population to become this effective campaign group called the Concerned Citizens of St. John. They're the people who really we've been talking to and inspired by, and they've given us the sort of the determination to tell the story that they want out there in, you know, a really respectful but powerful way. And that's what we're hoping the film's going to do. He sounds like Hilton Kelly of Port Arthur, Texas, who we interviewed, who's another local activist fighting another petrochemical polluter. So who is this company? Is this an American Japanese company? I mean, how do they have the power they have? Well, originally the plant was opened by DuPont. DuPont invented neoprene. It was originally called Duprene, but they wanted it to be attractive to other companies. So they thought if they if it was like branded Duprene, it would be forever um, associated with DuPont. So they dreamt up this name, Neoprene. And they opened this plant. I think it opened in 69, the late 60s. And since then, they've been producing a lot of chloroprene there. That was going on unchallenged until the um, National Air Toxics Assessment, which was 2016. Around that time, DuPont sold the facility to a Japanese company called Denka. But they... DuPont retain the land. They still own the land. When you go past it, it's got two signs, DuPont and Denka. Denka, they're a Japanese company, as I say, and they also make chloroprene in Japan. Okay, a quick break here. I'm sure you recognize my voice. I'm your co-host, David Helvarg. I'm also executive director of Blue Frontier that sponsors Rising Tide. If you enjoy our talks with the watermen and women making a difference for our ocean world, You might also want to check out our other work at www.bluefront.org. There you'll find links to many other projects, including our Blue Movement directory of over 1,200 ocean activist organizations, many near you. Again, check us out at bluefront.org. And if you enjoy Rising Tide, the Ocean podcast, spread the word to friends and families from sea to shining sea. And now, back to the show. So... Back in the early 1960s, uh, Bill and Bob Maestrel, uh, you know, pulled some insulation out of the back of a refrigerator and made their own wetsuits. And then they went on to uh, become the manufacturers of Body Glove. And I'm wondering if uh, the major manufacturers like O'Neill and Body Glove, I mean, they know where they're getting the material from. Are they aware of your film? And uh, have you gotten any feedback from uh, the manufacturers in terms of what they're doing or worrying about this? I think one of the things that we've come to realize is um, in the three years that we've become experts on chloroprene rubber and chloroprene rubber supply chains, which is a sentence that I never thought I would ever, you know, say, is 
there are brands out there that I certainly think had no idea where their chloroprene rubber was coming from. And then I think there are brands that have known where their chloroprene rubber is coming from. So I think as international supply chains have become kind of more opaque, I think there have been people within brands that should have been more on it, should have known what was going on. But then I also believe that there have been people who have been told about this. Because what you have to understand is that this is a story that when the National Air Toxic Assessment Report was released by EPA, made national headlines. You know, it was on NBC, CBS, Fox News, was in The Guardian. It, you know, it made global headlines. So if you work in the wetsuit world, if you work in the world of neoprene, you would have seen those reports. You would have seen mention of chloroprene rubber and it being manufactured and it being linked to cancer. So, you know, it, it does stretch it slightly for people then to turn around and say, I had no idea this was happening, you know, because that's one of the things we get from talking to the people who, you know, live in the shadow of this plant is they say, I've done probably 50 interviews with news teams and nothing's changed. So this is not a story that we have found that no one else has covered before. But I think what's different about the way that we're trying to tell the story is we're trying to tell people what the product is that's coming out of this factory and that's eventually ending up being used by surfers and cyclists and, you know, swimmers and, you know, runners and whoever in, in your car. If, if you know what the product is, then you as a consumer, as a, you know, as a human have a, a choice to make. And it's something that's been, that was denied to Lewis and I, I mean, We've worn wetsuits that have originated in Cancer Alley. You know, we've worn wetsuits with chloroprene rubber in. And we had no choice. You know, we've been complicit in this story, but we were never given the opportunity to make a choice. And I think one of the things that we feel strongly about is that people should be given a choice and they should be informed where the raw materials within the products that they're buying, and then they can make a choice as a consumer because there are alternatives available and that's one of the things about this story is there is a, an alternative and that alternative is just as good as petrochemical or so-called limestone neoprene i mean i've seen you know i've seen limestone being pushed as an alternative and a more sustainable alternative you guys talk about that a bit um natural rubber and ulex is it seems like is the ultimate alternative can you can you talk a little bit more about um, what what alternative surfers and and water water people have? It's not just Ulex. There are other natural rubbers that that could be used. You know, Ulex is probably the one that is furthest down the track for the surfing use. One of the issues we've encountered is that um, for the past probably ten years or so, surfing has been selling people a so-called green ethical environmental alternative, which is what they have labeled limestone neoprene. And chemically, it's exactly the same as petrochemical neoprene in that it is made from chloroprene and then polymerized into chloroprene rubber and then made into a foam and made into a wetsuit. But the source material, rather than being um, petrochemical, is limestone. So limestone is the carbon source because you need a lot of carbon because it's basically, it's a carbon chain that you're creating, um, a carbon mo a, a carbon polymer. Now, to, in order to get the limestone, you have to quarry it from the ground using the, this huge machinery that's all diesel powered. It's then transported to a giant furnace where it's melted and then converted through a, like a, a complex chemical process to produce chloroprene. Now, just, just hearing that, you go, well, that doesn't sound very environmental to me. But what we have done in the film is, you know, we have gone and spoken to independent chemists and said, talk to us about limestone neoprene. And they've said, if anything, limestone neoprene is worse than petrochemical neoprene because 
the carbon footprint is huge from this process. So unfortunately, what's been happening in, in the surfing world, and I'm sure I don't know what, what it's like within the swimming world or the, you know, uh, triathlon world or other wetsuit wearers, but there's been a degree of greenwashing going on that has confused the, you know, the consumer because the consumer has gone to what they thought was an ethical and environmental alternative. And the problem now is that a brand like, you know, um, Ulex comes along and they say, well, we're sustainable, we're ethical, you know, uh, our foam comes from trees, you know, it's FSC certified. The consumer's now com confused because for years they thought they were buying the environmental alternative. And uh, and what we need to see... Asha, happening is don't, don't you have a limestone uh, <laughs> wetsuit? Of course I do. Because, <laughs> um, you know, that's what we all thought was, was the, you know, one of the answers. Mm. Um, but um, now, now we know that it's not. And um, yeah, I think it's, conf I mean, it's so confusing and there's no standards and this idea of labeling it as environmentally sustainable or natural, you know, what, what does that really mean? And if there's not some kind of global standard, then as, right. as you're saying, Chris, like, how is the consumer supposed to know? And is there a so-called, you were saying there's a tree-based uh, wetsuit? What is that? That's, that's like cellulose based. And is that any better? Just briefly, I mean, neoprene was invented as a, um, it's a synthetic rubber. But, you know, for years, natural rubber was used and was very successful. And I think what happened is we then went down a cul-de-sac of, you know, everything had to be petrochemical based because that was great. That was the future, you know. But natural rubber is, is a great product and works well as the basis for wetsuits. You know, I think a lot of brands now are putting money into R&D to produce foams that are as good as, you know, synthetic rubber. And um, and we're not pushing any brand's, you know, agenda here. It's just performance wise. I mean, Lewis and I both wear natural rubber wetsuits and surf in, you know, the cold in the UK. And but for me, they're as good as a, a neoprene wetsuit. I think what we're starting to see is a number of brands are starting to offer a Ulex wetsuit within their range or a couple of Ulex wetsuits. I think we have to try and judge, is that a window dressing or is that a genuine move, you know, away from neoprene? And, and again, I'm Ulex hoping... is a rubber wetsuit? Yes. So Ulex is, is a brand name. They developed, so they worked in the field of natural rubber. And a number of years ago, um, they heard about the problems with wetsuits and um, with neoprene. And I think they thought, I wonder whether we can develop a natural rubber alternative to neoprene foam. And so it's been many years in the making, but they've got to a point now where their foams are really very good. Um, and so a number of manufacturers are using Ulex, there's also another form of natural rubber foam. So there are a couple of natural rubber foams that have come into the marketplace and um, and are available for brands to use. So I guess we're hopeful that, you know, when this story does actually fully break, when the film comes out, maybe that'll be the driver that will cause change within the surf industry. And although the surf industry, I mean, it's it's not a small industry in that it is a multi-billion dollar industry. I think what we're hoping is that this will then cause ripple effects throughout other neoprene users. So, for example, if you're a cycle brand and you hear about, well, why are all the surfing brands ditching neoprene for a natural rubber alternative? What's wrong with neoprene? And then they'll start to think about, well, we use neoprene. Maybe we should be looking at where do we get our neoprene from? Is this the right thing for us? Hopefully that'll cause ripple effects through to other industries and cause like actually lead to a real change for the population in, in St. John's. I mean, yes. We, I mean, I hope this film, you know, starts a conversation and then actually has impact on the supply chains. Uh, um, can you tell our, our listeners, you know, how they can see the film and how they can learn more about this? And in terms of, and also just your impact campaign with the film. 
we're going to be rolling out the film through the festival circuit primarily, but then um, we'll be hoping to get the film onto a platform, whether it's broadcast media or, you know, uh, a Netflix or wherever. Um, we also have our socials that people can follow us on the Instagram. Um, and we have the big C.org is our website where they can learn more about the project. And we also have um, various campaigns that we're going to be rolling out that people could help support with as a uh, kind of uh, hashtag say no to neoprene. Anyone who's a, a diver or surfer, uh, anyone who's wearing neoprene, maybe while exercising, uh, while listening to this podcast, please check out Big C, the documentary that will be out soon. And thank you, uh, Chris and um, Lewis, for joining us today on uh, the Rising Tide Ocean podcast. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Natasha. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for uh, highlighting the issues around this. Rising Tide is a production of Blue Frontier, co-hosted by David Helborg and myself, Vicki Nichols Goldstein, with support from Natasha Benjamin and Ellie Curla. Rising Tide's editing services and technical support is provided by Studio Kate May. The theme song is written and performed by Ethan Kenbard. You can find Rising Tide, the ocean podcast at bluefront.org or download it from Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcast. Off in the salty ocean, off where the waves are free, the sparkling water rises, then crashes to the sea. Out amongst the breakers, you'll have no need to fear. It's true, it's the blue frontier. Tear, tear, tear. Off in the salty ocean, off to the blue frontier. Sparky, come here, buddy. Sparky, there you are. Good boy, Sparky.